get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we record this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to elders past and present. Today I am talking to Ned Brockman. You would have seen Ned all over social media recently and soon you are going to be seeing him all over bookstores as well because he is releasing a book. Ned joins me in studio now. I love to start all of my podcasts off with asking my guests what they're fixated on. What are you obsessing over? It can be a person, a place, a thing, a hobby, a food. Uh, I think it's golf because of my uh, lack of uh, needing to run a lot anymore. I'm now um, fixated on golf, just trying to hit that perfect golf shot. Amazing. And have you like have you always been like a golf person or is this a, a brand new hobby? Nah, brand new. As of January, got fixed, uh, sorted out with some golf clubs uh, through one of my sponsors from the run. So um, I've taken up trying to be the next Tiger Woods. Oh my God, love that. Can't wait to see you being the next Tiger Woods. Obsessed. On the the PGA, (laughs) absolutely. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to be blunt honest with you. I have been uh, professionally for a job for a reason, stalking the absolute heck out of you, right? Nice. Looking at you on TikTok, in my um, sleuthing, I discovered that my sister is a massive fan of you and she is not going to listen to this, but she would hate if she heard me say this. But I sent her a message yesterday and I was like, hey, do you know Ned Brockman? And I've got the text chain here. I'm going to read it out to you. So I said, hey, do you know Ned Brockman? And she goes, not personally. I'm like, no, but are you a fan of him? And she goes, oh, I mean, I guess so. And I was like, oh, I'm interviewing him tomorrow. And she goes, oh, my God, I love him. (laughs) (laughs) and I was like tell me some insights tell me what I need to know here's what she said she goes I mean I have his merch and think he's one of the best people in the entire world next message he had maggots in his toe (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's a common one yeah yeah what else she say following up she goes so this is just like dot points so the following dot points are almost died has a cute dog oh and by the way I love him so that's your overview I love how um, I love how she goes. Oh yeah, he's all right. Then you go up interviewing him, and all of a sudden she's the biggest fan girl on earth. <laughs> I know it's so funny. She also she bought your jumper. That's how I like thought about it because I was like, I've seen this in my house before, and then I was like, oh my god, my sister. So she owns your merch. You got her boyfriend into doing marathons. He's like now a full marathon runner because of you. Man, you're changing. You're 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 doing things, man. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty exciting. Like, it's a wild, it's been a wild ride. And I, when I do see like the to the moon tops or the just keep showing up tops around Sydney and and even you know down the coast or in in a New South Wales, it's a bit of a wig out seeing you know how many people got behind the run. Has it happened a lot? Um, yeah, it um, it, it has happened quite a lot. Every every second person because the mullet's quite recognisable. Right. Um, most people you know, recognize me from the back before they get me from the front. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just been a whirlwind, you know, 11 months ago, I was, um, twisting cables and chasing brick walls, being an electrician. Uh, but now I'm, you know, going around doing the talking circuit and, and, and thinking about my next run. Which is incredible. Cause it kind of, I mean, obviously this is something that you've been, you know, training for and all that for a long time, but to the outside audience, it really kind of looks like an overnight success, right? Like you kind of went from being a tradie to being, recognized by strangers in Sydney and on the train and having, you know, seeing your merch out in the wild, like that must be bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre. I, I thought it was always going to happen. I, it wasn't, it was kind of overnight in a way. I didn't, I didn't actually train for it for too long, to be honest. So mm-hmm. probably a year, it's, it's not a lifetime goal of mine to get this done, but uh, yeah, it is, uh, it's a pinch yourself moment when people are wanting photos in Woolies and uh, yelling out, let's go out the windows when I'm on a run. So it's, it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's pretty surreal. <laughs> Of course. And with all of the success and stuff, you've also got some pretty exciting news. You've got a book coming out, right? Uh, yeah, uh, very excited about that. Uh, it'll be, you know, I've only really through Instagram, only people have really only seen snippets from each day. And I think the book will allow us to kind of deep dive into the mindset and um, kind of what actually went on in detail out on the run. And yeah, it's pretty powerful. And, and again, 24 and have a book. I think it's pretty, um, pretty special incredibly special that must be so exciting I'm so happy for you yeah thank you I appreciate that thank you a lot so your motto is just keep showing up which I love I want that tattooed on my forehead what does it mean to you and and where does that motto come from 
Um, I think it's just a Ned Cowboy way of saying uh, be resilient. Um, I think over, you know, when I was born, uh, I was born, brought up in central West New South Wales, my dad, um, just a hard farmer who never complained, always uh, did the hard yards without, you know, a mention of how hard it was. And I think by just watching him, I um, learnt that, you know, you've just got to show up in the good and the bad days. It'll, if you don't throw the towel in, you find a way when it, when it gets hard, um, brighter days will come. And I think I've just lived like that probably since 18 years old, just find a, found the harder option of, of every option I had, every decision would, that was made. I, I opted for the harder, harder option. And then when, you know, it got hard out there on the run, it was just, just keep showing up. There'll be a better day. There'll be a better day. And, you know, I had a had a finish line, which is Bondi, and I was always going to get there. So it just mattered. Um, it mattered about showing up and, and finding a way to get there. Yeah, but I love it. I live live through that for sure. I love it. I think it's incredible. Now, for those who don't know, you ran three thousand nine hundred and fifty three kilometers, correct? Yeah, give or take five or ten. Yeah, give or take. Okay, it's a lot, like a heck ton of kilometers <laughs> from yeah. WA yeah. to Sydney, which for people that aren't living in Australia, literally you could not get far. Like that's other sides of the map. Like that's hectic. Yeah, it was pretty hectic. So you ran to, from one side of Australia to the other, but you started you, with an injury? You were already injured before you even started? Yeah, you have done your research. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I went in <laughs> with with um, severe patellofemoral pain in my knees and I had a stress fracture mm-hmm. in my tibia about three months prior. So that doesn't help when you've got 700K a week to run ahead of you for the next seven weeks. Um, mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I guess I just kind of worked out a way in that, that mantra of just keep showing up when, you know, if I couldn't run for training, I just walked. If I couldn't walk, I'd get on the bike and um, I knew that, when the time had come, I'd locked in sponsors for September. I'd locked in a few other things that meant I had to do it. So uh, when your purpose and your reason why is bigger than your reason to quit, you'll just you'll show up and keep going. I love that. Purpose and a reason why being bigger than your reason to quit. That is, that's that's my new saying. That's, uh, that's the one go. I'm tattooing on my forehead. By the end of this, <laughs> I was going to say, by the end of this, you're going to have some frigging tattoos all over your body. I love it. And you know what? Period. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) with all of that in mind, you faced a lot of physical injuries in your run. Uh, Was it harder for you mentally or or physically to get through doing that run? It was 100% physical and 100% mental. I say that to everyone. It's um, without the hardness in the head, the uh, physical would actually give way. So I think it's like, not assuming either. It's actually assuming that both are going to be just as hard as each other. That the sheer fact of waking up the next morning after running 700k in seven days, uh, you've you know got maggots in your toes, blistered feet, um, tendonitis in basically every tendon from the belly button down. Uh, it's pretty pretty mental, but also very incredibly physical. Yeah, of course. How did you prepare for that? Like obviously physically, but I'm mostly interested in mentally. How you prepare for that? Mm. Um, to be honest, your preparation is probably 70% um, mental because yep. you you can't um, go in this with any kind of doubt, like any percentage of doubt. You have to go, I'm going to get this done no matter the cost, no matter the rain, hail, shine, whatever it is, you are going to get there. Um, so I was doing, as I said earlier, is like, if I had an option to take the comfortable route or the uncomfortable route, I would always take the the uncomfortable option. So whenever I, every single shower, I would have a cold shower. I would never, ever turn on the hot water. I would go and have an ice bath. I would go and run the extra K when I, you know, shouldn't. Wow. Um, so I would just do things that got me so uncomfortable. So when I didn't have the choice to be in discomfort out on the run, I was well equipped for um, whatever was ahead. Incredible. Did you... Oh, I'm assuming there's lots. What did you learn about yourself through that challenge and, and what things surprised you that you learned about yourself? Uh, how long we got on this chat? No. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> I learned that we're so much more capable than what we think, but uh, we always have a limit and I think our minds put that limit on us. So, you know, you get to a point, you're like, this is, this is cooked. I've done way more than anyone's ever done. I can call it here, but I think, again, if your reasons, reason why is bigger than your reason to not, I think you just, if you can find a way, you're just so much more capable of whatever you even can imagine. 
Uh, I found that out probably running through a heap of injuries and um, yeah, I just learned that the power of the mind is like is is pretty incredible. It's like you, if you've got one that won't quit, your body will just follow. And um, and I learned that uh, the people around me are very important because they want to see me succeed. I learned that mm-hmm. through uh, probably pushing them away initially, um, but finding out through you know a bit of hardship out on the Nullarbor. I found that they were just as important as I was to get across across this country. Without them, I wouldn't have got to day two. With your running, you raised $2.5 million in total for We Are Mobilize, a homeless charity. Why did you want to raise money for them? What's your connection to them? Yeah, um, so when I moved to Sydney from the country, I uh, was a bit taken back by how many people were homeless in Sydney. I knew yep. there was homeless people out in the country, but I didn't realise the amount in Sydney and how prevalent it is. So I, it was had a profound effect on me. Uh, every time I'd walk past them, I'd have to help. And basically just uh, started running through COVID and ended up uh, raising a heap of money in 2020 for, for homelessness. And then, uh, yeah, fast forward to 2022, I was like, I want to do this, but make it bigger and, and really make some make some change. And yeah, ended up raising, it was actually about 2.6 million, which was wild. Um, over 37,000 people donated, which, you know, I think the largest donation was wow. $10,000. So it obviously hit a lot of people, um, you know, square between the eyes and I was pretty, pretty cool. It wasn't just all about, you know, big corporates looking good. It was actually like everyone uh, wanted to help out. Yeah. And you've had, I mean, like you said, you've had so much support from what sounds like your family, which is, sounds like an incredible support network from um, Australia in general, all of Australia. And like, I've seen your TikToks, you've had the whole world get behind you on this journey, which is absolutely bloody incredible. You've had people like Hamish Blake get behind you. What what an incredible thing to go, I'm going to run and then have all of Australia on your side. That must be such an incredible, overwhelmingly supportive feeling. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And like, Touching on people like Haim, Hamish is a good friend of mine, but it's like um, the people who message me saying, you know, I've never run before, now I ran 5K around this lake or uh, through labour, I just kept saying your mantra of get comfortable being uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. people like, you know, these those messages I was receiving um, were just as powerful as a message from someone of a social status. And I think like that was what was cool. It was everyone. It was touching everyone. It was like it was not this... Um, you know, oh my God, I'm trying to look like something. It was like the power of uh, social media is quite amazing when um, when it's used for good. The amount of money that you've raised for charity is incredible. Have you heard responses saying that it's been of help already? Yeah, so I'm working pretty closely with um, Mobilize in, you know, just kind of watching where all that money goes and, and how it is spent. But they are they're all volunteers mobilized. It was started by Noah, who's 25. He started it six years wow. ago uh, when he was uh, literally doing what I'm doing, which was walking the street and going, holy crap, this is ridiculous how many people are homeless here. I need to help. And yeah. so he started through having conversations with them and, and actually helping, um, you know, like with food and conversation, seeing where the help can be given. And now they've got the funding. It's uh, basically given this... Um, they're doing a give back program where they, you know, this money, if, if someone on the street can save two grand, they'll match it to give them healthcare, to give them a uh, place to rent, and they'll just really support them in that way. And, uh, you know, set up bank accounts and, and basically give them a, a, a helping hand to get them off the street. And it's um, it's pretty cool. But yeah, there's there's already been instances where uh, we've got old made a phone or someone's come up and there's wow. been a heap of, um, yeah, already straight away with or getting work, like work on a site. And yeah, it's pretty powerful. That's incredible. That's, man, good job, man. And what a brilliant organization. It's so important that we yeah. talk, have these discussions more. Um, good on you for raising not just money, but I think even more importantly, awareness of it. Because it's not just the, it's not just your if, a heck ton amount of money that's going to make the change. It's the fact that now people are aware, first of all, of the organization that can help people. Second of all, of what an epidemic it is that we have such an, an insane amount of homelessness in our country. Um, good yeah, job. It is an absolute epidemic. Um, it's something everyone overlooks, especially in eastern suburbs in the city. You've got this polarizing yep. um, high rises and then you've got people sleeping rough under them. It's like this contrast and it's something that like, you know, 
people off the bus or drive past and then Merck and go, oh, you know, it's just another homeless person. But I think, you know, they're all just yeah. people like you and I and it's a it's something that, you know, I'd love to change and why in a country that's so, you know, we've got everything in our fingertips that people have to live like that. So, Such a rich country. Yeah, yeah. and I Absolutely. like don't remember the number exactly but we're like all of us are only a couple of decisions away from being in that exact same position. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, um, and the, and the common thing is it's, um, you know, it seems that it's like drug and alcohol, but it's, that's only 2% of the reason for homelessness. It's actually yep. like housing affordability, domestic violence, um, you know, lack of, uh, people to lean on. So mm-hmm. uh, as you said, it might be one paycheck away and all of a sudden you're, you've got no one to fall back on and you're on the street. So I think it's 120,000 people um, in Australia alone are yeah, don't wow. have a place to stay. So it's a lot. Yeah, 100%. Ned, you've been really embraced as this inspirational figure. As you were saying before, you've had so many people tell you that they've gone out of the way and that they've started living the same way that you live because of your message, because of what you've done. How do you feel and what does it make you think when you have people coming up to you in the street or, you know, sliding into your DMs and telling you that you are an inspiration to them or, and you know, see you as, as brave and inspiring? I think it's cool, but I, uh, for me, like I've been doing this for four years now, but no one's seen it. And so now I've got eyes yeah. on it. It's, um, it doesn't change it. It's just a weird, it's a weird thing to try and navigate because I used to be able to just, uh, you know, head down the street and not and, and do my thing and not have to, um, you know, go, let's go back or um, tell someone, you know, keep it up, mate. And it's it's like a really cool scenario to be in, but it is um, sometimes it's quite overwhelming, but I'm forever grateful for the for the support. Without, um, without the support of everyone, we wouldn't have this awesome kind of community that we've built. And it's like community is feeling a part of something. And I think so many people felt like they were a part of the run and a part of my life and where it's heading. And I think... Um, I'd love to continue to bring him along on the journey. Amazing. And you have, you are universally loved, but I, I feel Australia in particular has so deeply embraced you and embraced your message and embraced who you are and, and what you do and what you have done. But I guess I want to know, has there ever been a time in your life or even in this current journey that you're currently on where you haven't felt embraced or where you haven't felt accepted? I've always felt accepted. Like I'm very lucky that I've had a... Uh, a loving family and caring family. And I, I'm not one to have a heap of friends, but my friends are very important to me. And, and, and those ones, I hold mm-hmm. it very tight. I think I've, um, I think when I pre this run, I, I was doing a few crazy things. I ran 50 marathons in 50 days at the back end of 2020 while working. Wow. And yeah, which was pretty wild. Um, I'd work a eight hour day and then go run 42 K at night and do that again for 50 days. Um, but through the end of that, I've, We've got a bit of a following and people uh, following along and loving it. And I thought people were loving me for the distance I was running, not for who I was and what who I was doing are, yeah. and why I was doing it. And I fell in this false like uh, sense of who, who I am. And when I got injured post that, I, I just went into this kind of, you know, deep dark state of like, well, who am I? Because now I can't do this one thing I thought my life was heading towards. All of a sudden I'm, I'm not me anymore. I'm not Ned Brockman, you know. Mm. Uh, but to get injured, I've realized that, oh, no, people still love me for who I am and what I do. It's, it doesn't matter about um, the Ks you run. It's, it's the grit and willingness to show up and fight the fight every day. It's not got nothing to do with the, the output is the, 100, is the 42K or the 100K, but the outcome is that, um, you know, willingness to keep showing up when, it, when everyone says no. Yeah, 100%. You hold value as the person that you are rather than what you do. Exactly, yeah. With your run... You obviously gains a mega amount of public media attention and, and followers in such a short amount of time. At what point did you realise that there would be quite a crowd and fuss when you finally did make it to Bondi? Uh, I knew each day I was probably, when the f- money was getting raised, I think the followers were climbing as well. So even one day in, mm-hmm. um, we just hit New South Wales, I think we raised $100,000 in a day just because I screamed at the phone saying... Wow. Uh, all, you know, we're only at half a million. We need to hit a million in seven days. And I think within that day, we raised 100,000, uh, which shows the kind of intent the followers had by watching me in the engagement. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think I hit about 100,000 just when I hit New South Wales. And I was like, oh, this is going to blow up. Um, and yeah, when I got to Bondi, I kind of had a bit of a sense when I got got to Wagga, when 
There was about 400 people on Wagga Main Street. Um, but when I hit, yeah, when I hit Bondi and heading down Bondi Road and I saw like the whole promenade just covered in people on a Monday afternoon with, uh, you know, no one on the beach, I realised that it was pretty freaking huge. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, I, I got a bit of tall poppy syndrome and, and, and that, you know, <laughs> you don't know, deserve this. And um, But then I quickly reined it back in and went, oh, no, you've earned every single last minute of this, so embrace it. And yeah, it was pretty – it was pretty um, – it was wild. It was absolutely wild. And I, I, I was forever, like, forever just, like, so grateful for that opportunity to just – like, that's one in a billion finish line feels, you know. Like, I don't think many people will ever get to uh, feel something like that. Oh, my goodness, 100%. The euphoria that must have felt and seeing all of that support must have been, I imagine, incredibly overwhelming. Yeah, it was. And I, I wish I could bottle that up and, and drink it every day, but it's um, uh-huh. one thing that – You've just got to um, take as it is and there's good and bad and, and that was uh, one of the good good times of my life. So if I can feel that eight to ten more times over my next 50, 50 or so years, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, I think you'd be doing bloody well to be feeling that. <laughs> oh, I will. I will again. I have sure. absolutely no doubt. Maybe maybe doing golf. Maybe when you become the next Tiger Woods. That's right. That's right. When I win the Masters. When I win the Masters in 2021. Absolutely. Can't wait. <laughs> um, I want to ask, you ran so far, so much, were injured multiple times, had literal maggots growing in your body. What the heck? Mm-hmm. I literally, like, I'll, I'll do, like, a half-hour fitness session and I'll be dead the next day. How did you, uh, the next day after you finished your run, t- explain, how did you feel? Yeah, I was pumped that I didn't have to run. Um, but <laughs> I was, it was quite a shock because I'd, I was basically in fight or flight mode from the 1st of September when I started. So I yep. um, I, I did like this. I'm not putting this lightly. I ruined my body. Like I, I tore yep. pretty well every tendon from the hips down. And, yeah, I, I wasn't in a good way when I finished. So I was so inflamed when I finished. Like even when I mm-hmm. finished the run, that next day I didn't have to run. But I still woke up and my body was like, well, you're – you've tormented us to try and run every day. So now we're going to torment going. you for stopping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've probably only, you know, 70% of the way recovered. I'm still still dealing with a lot of injuries and, um, yeah, a lot of stuff yeah. that, you know, not the average runner would uh, would have to deal with. But, um, yeah, I guess I had three beers that night and, uh, and went to sleep and I was still <laughs> inflamed and, uh, yeah, and I woke up very, very chuffed. I didn't have to run again. Yeah, I'm sure. What an incredible feat. How, what does your recovery process look like? Um, I'm kind of back into like strength training and running and um, like ice bathing, saunas, just sleeping, to be honest. Sleep's the crucial one and, and food. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just straight after it was a bit of like, oh, God, you just got to calm your nervous system. Uh, just a whole lot of sleeping, a whole lot of just like in the water, just recover, just be zen, a bit more zen. Mm-hmm. But people like me, Chloe, need to uh, do hard things. So it's hard when I have to lay down for a month or so post-run because I'm excited about the prospect of what's next. Of course. Um, mm-hmm. But I was, yeah, I, it's it's been good and, and, and I'm over, the, over talking about my injuries now. I'm just keen to get on with the next one. So fair, absolutely. You've said on your Instagram that we, and have said in this talk multiple times too, that we should get comfortable with the uncomfortable. What makes you uncomfortable and, and what have you learned from exploring that, that discomfort? Um, my, what makes me uncomfortable is not living a life where I don't reach my full potential. So right. um, I think that, that scares me and that makes me, um, that's why I probably get up every morning and go after it and get after it. I think... Um, yeah, that, that's daunting to me, you know, living I, – I think and I was probably heading down that path when I was about 20 years old of, like, just living a life and, and being happy that I've, I've lived and whatever. But I kind of then had this fork in a road moment when you've got to, you've got to make something of this. Um, and I'm glad I went through that at 20. A lot of people go through that when they're 40 or 50 and go, geez, what have I uh-huh. done for the last 30 years? Or possibly um, never go through it and have this, like, that's right. end-of-life crisis. Yeah, or they just they have an existence that they go, oh, you know, it was cool, but they never yeah. really gain much out of it. I'm, I'm, we need those people as well, but for me, I just I like I'm so glad I found this, 
you know, through intentional suffering, this excitement and this growth and this opportunities that present themselves when you, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. And I think, yeah, I, I'm scared of never really finding out my true potential. That's what makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. We are almost out of time, but I love finishing my interviews with something that I like to call the Boldly Me 3, which is just three quick fire questions that I ask every single one of my guests. Are you ready? I'm absolutely ready. Okay. Nice. Okay. Number one is what's one song that never fails to make you feel happy? Miley Cyrus, high. Obsessed. Did you listen to that? I, 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 I know we're at the end, but I need to ask. Did you what? Did you have a song that you listened to when you were running that just and and was it that? Oh uh, yeah, that or the climb or um, ACDC. A few. There's three ACDC songs, but we'll say Miley. Miley the climb. Obsessed. We love a Miley stan. <laughs> She's a queen. Okay. A queen. Second question is: What is one piece of advice that you would give your 13 year old self? I think embrace all opportunities. Don't um, turn down things that get you scared. Um, you know, I think they're the most formulative years. So I think um, don't take any, don't assume any opportunities bad or good. They just are what they are, and just go with it. And if it's the wrong thing, cool. You found out that it was wrong, but don't don't um, sit back wondering. I think you know, go head first at whatever it is because there, that's where you learn, right? This is just like. A hundred. Yeah, here's this opportunity. Let's go. Um, I just, yeah, it's it's exciting. The thought and prospect of the potential. You know, if I had this mindset when I was ten years prior, it would be mind blowing. It'd be so cool. But I think you have to go through those hard things to find out and be able to and, and implement that. Hundred percent. I think you're more likely to regret the things that you don't do rather than the things that you do do. Because every lesson is exactly that a lesson. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, third question. I'm interested to hear the answer of this one. If you could be any Disney character, who would you be and why? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know Disney characters. Can you hit me with a few? Yeah. So I'm a bit. I know. No, I was thinking that. Okay, wait. Let me see, let me figure out who I think you would be. Okay, cool. That's great. <laughs> I reckon you could be Bolt, like the dog. Perfect. <gasps> I reckon. I reckon Suits he'd me. look like you if he was a person. <laughs> I love it. It's high energy, vibey, got the lightning bolt, so he's fast. Um, and I reckon if he was a person, he'd have a mullet. So. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Perfect. So good. Now, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Awesome, Chloe. Thank you. You're a ball of energy. It's been great. What an incredible and strong, strong-willed person Ned is. I do want to preface, though, after listening to Ned speak, strength comes in so many different ways and shapes and forms. And I think it is really important for all of you guys to know and to understand that your strength may look like running 4,000 kilometers across Australia and it may look like pushing past your limits. Or maybe for you, strength looks like understanding and knowing where your limits are and embracing and accepting and knowing them. Strength comes in so many different ways and no matter what way your strength shows up, it is important to listen to your body and to listen to your mind and to listen to what you need. Thank you so much for listening to Boldly Me. If you liked what you heard, make sure to rate and review the show on your podcast app if it lets you and tell a friend. Most importantly, be kind to yourself, be kind to others and do whatever makes you feel happy. Bye.